whether that was to solve a problem, design a solution, provide some perspective on a project. And I know that you do that not just for me, but you do that for a whole range of educators in both K-12 and higher education settings. Now, I know that Hypothesis isn't expressly an ed tech tool, nor is it an educational expressly organization. And yet Hypothesis, in my assessment, is one of the most responsive, discerning, and inspired organizations that's impacting educational technology. And today we're gonna to hear about why that is. It's my time to get out of the way. I really wanna focus on our esteemed panel this afternoon. And we'll be joined by four accomplished educators who will discuss their experiences as designers, as facilitators, and as researchers of learning. Now, contrary to the popular trope of the overwhelmed or disempowered educator, our panelists today will highlight a counter-narrative of creativity and agency, whereby educators who care deeply about their students and their students' well-being and their students' learning are eager to experiment, to iterate, and to inquire so as to create more engaging, more relevant, and lasting learning experiences. And of course, they're gonna do so by talking about annotation. So today, we'll hear from Juan Pablo Alperen, Larry Hanley, Kelly Hutchinson, and Brian Luckoff about how educators are again designing, facilitating, and also measuring learning. And whether they're in classrooms, or they're online, or in some hybrid in-between space, we'll hear about the power of annotation and how that's impacting why their students are learning. Practically speaking, our presenters will share for about 10 minutes and then we'll follow that with a few minutes of question and answer. And I will briefly introduce each of the panelists before they present so you have a bit of context and so they can set up and move through their slides and information. I'd also like to add briefly that some of their slides and some of their information is already loaded into our shared uh, notepad, and this is, of course, accessible via the schedule. So we're going to dive right in. And we'll begin, um, if I'm not mistaken, we're here, with uh, Juan Pablo Alperin. So Juan is an assistant professor in the publishing program at Simon Fraser University as well as the Assistant Director of Research for the Public Knowledge Project. In both of these roles, Juan is an open access advocate and a researcher of scholarly communication with a focus on understanding the value that the public finds in scholarly work. He believes that by having students work in the open, they will understand the value of public scholarship and become more publicly engaged citizens. He's been studying his students' use of hypothesis in the classroom and is interested in figuring out ways of encouraging students to remain engaged and to improve their learning outcomes. Please join me in welcoming Juan. All right, so thank you for having me. Thank you for that very generous introduction of this, uh, this whole panel. I set up some very lofty expectations that now I will hope to try to meet. Uh, we'll see how well I can do that. So what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, I've been an assistant professor now. This is third year now that I've finished. Uh, so I'm you know, fairly still new at this game. Um, but I've been experimenting with doing online annotations in my classrooms for these last three years. I teach both, uh, I teach in a publishing program, both uh, upper level undergrad and a seminar course that both have uh, and a project course in which I don't use hypothesis, but two courses a year where I've used hypothesis uh, for the last two years. So I want to share a little bit um, some of the insights and some of my motivations for doing so, as well as some of the things that I found. Uh, this very last iteration when I ran the, uh, the graduate seminar course, I um, got some, a little bit of uh, funding from the Teaching and Learning Center at my university to be able to um, do a little bit of research into how the students were annotating. Uh, and this is something that I'm hoping to now replicate as, uh, as I go into next year as part of a fellowship that I've received from the university to try to study annotations across many more classrooms. So what I'll talk about today will just be about this, um, talking uh, broadly about my uh, motivations and my reasons for doing things as well as the experience, but then I'll talk about the experience of just this one classroom where I ran it and the, the surveys and the analytics that I ran on the students' annotations. 
as a way of getting some insights into what is going on when students are asked to annotate. First, I'll just talk a little bit about my own motivations because, and, and of course, I think for other people that are uh, working with uh, hypothesis in the classrooms, and I'm sure it's from, even from our panelists here, their reasons for wanting to do annotations in their classroom might be very different. But I think it's important for me to uh, make clear what are my motivations, because what are the things that I'm trying to accomplish with annotations, because I don't think that there's a single model or a single uh, way of doing annotating in the classroom that works. And the way that I've done it in the classroom is certainly um, based on and inspired by what is the reasons why I think students should be annotating in the first place. And like um, was sort of just said in the introduction by Remy is that I uh, consider myself to be an open access advocate, so open access to research. And I see this as uh, my way of doing annotations as a way of trying to promote open access to knowledge. And I see it by having the students be uh, seeing the value of putting their work out into the public sphere and having them understand that value of, uh, of openness through their own uh, work, as well as their ability to annotate things that are openly available and seeing what the value of that is. Um, asserting, the second thing is asserting the public mission of universities, something that I feel is very much under attack, and I think that this goes in both directions. Again, it's about the students uh, showing the world that they have things to contribute and showing the world that things that are going on at university have some public relevance and annotating things publicly is a way of doing that. And from the outside, for the outside world to then see that value and to all of a sudden realize that you know, universities have a public mission and they're somehow fulfilling that. And third, and this is perhaps a little bit even more lofty than the other two, if, if those weren't lofty enough, is fostering some civic uh, engagement and getting these students to try to want to engage beyond the classroom afterwards by make, but feeling comfortable in making public contributions. I think it's something that annotations have the potential to do and something that inspires me in trying to do my work. Um, I try to teach students to be open in many different ways by making all, and doing, and this is, annotation is just one of the many open practices that I do in the classroom. I make all my readings open, uh, open access. I have students publish all of their work. I give them all of the feedback on their essays uh, and through annotations, uh, and as well as I have students peer review each other through commenting. And sometimes when I teach an data analytics, I also have them use open data sources. So again, it's all part of open practices. Um, and I see many pedagogical advantages to doing, uh, and some of these, uh, there's been some, some research that's been done, but part of what I want to do in the next year is to study a little bit more. Um, I see annotations as an avenue for, um, uh, for students that are more shy, that don't feel comfortable speaking out in class, to have an opportunity to participate in that classroom setting. Um, I think annotations give students sort of a window into how other students read. They be it becomes a layer of, uh, of exposing what other students are thinking as they're going through the text, as well as myself, if I choose to annotate the text that they're doing. I think it causes students to actually read closely without skimming, right, all the way through the very end of the text because they know that I can see how far they've annotated. And so now it's, there's this, extra, and they know that their peers can see how far they've annotated. And so they know they have to keep reading because they're gonna have to be engaging with that text and there's some layer of transparency as to how far they got. And it exposes uh, students, uh, to, so it exposes to me what the students found interesting, and it really has allowed me to adapt what I do in my own classrooms based on what I, every, you know, the night before I go into the class, I go and I scan through, okay, look at all of the latest annotations of what they've done, and I take that, and I tailor the discussions in the classrooms to either address what they've already discussed or to touch on things that they have somehow missed that they didn't look. And so that, uh, that, uh, making that visible for me has been something that I think has improved my own teaching and how I'm able to tailor it. <coughs> and there's this one, I conducted a survey of students both at the midterm and at the end of the semester, and there was one quote of the students when I, uh, there was a, the, the, a part that just said, uh, what are the, you know, anything else that you would like to add? And I think this one student really captured the spirit of all of the things and all of the reasons why I think annotations are important. And I just want to read this out. It said, I enjoyed reading the annotations alongside the text primarily because it helps me engage with the text at the sentence level. I am the product of an educational system where annotation and critical reading was not encouraged and not taught. And so using the hypothesis tool really helps me understand how to read critically as opposed to just absorbing information. And then she went on to uh, say how she's been promoting and encouraging other people to also use hypothesis. And so what I decided to do, right, was to take these ideas, these are my motivations, I've been doing it for three years, but I hadn't tried to really measure the effect to, to see how these annotations 
were working in the classroom. And so what I did is build a little tool with the help of a developer to um, capture all those annotations through the API and then to just produce some very simple metrics. And I just want to just run through them very quickly as a way of giving you an understanding of how students, they don't all annotate the same and they don't all engage in the same way. But there's some interesting things that I already was able to find. Even just with this, this is just again from one course. Don't, don't take these to be um, representative of all annotations. First is I found that uh, not all students annotate the same amount, right? So you get some you know, super prolific annotators. This is total number of words annotated over the course of the semester. Um, and then some students you know, on the very right, you know, DM and HD, uh, annotated a lot less throughout the semester. The number of words that they contributed to discussions was a lot, uh, was a lot less. Uh, interesting, one of the students sort of in the middle towards the side is a student that hardly ever spoke in class. Right? Someone that was actually not very comfortable with her level of English, but uh, she is sort of the fourth or fifth here on this list of the most, uh, the most vocal in the online space. Right? So those are, um, you start to see some of those dynamics play out. Annotations from week to week really show when students get busy and when they're not. Uh, so there's a couple of week three and six, there was no class. So you see that there's some, um, some variance there. Uh, week seven is when I gave them their midterm grades for the semester. And so you see that there's a big spike coming right back up on week eight after they realized the ones that were not doing as well decided they should once again re, uh, re-engage with online annotations. So it's variable and as the semester gets busy, they drop off at the end as their final term projects come due. Right? So students, their ability to engage critically varies based on how much uh, throughput they also have. It takes time and effort to annotate. And if they are overtaxed with their other courses, their ability to do so diminishes. Um, curiously, the students who annotate more don't, it's not that they write a lot of short annotations. So the annotations had about 40 words on average per annotation, and regardless of how here we have on the, you know, on the x-axis is the number of annotations, right, with a student going it's over 300 annotations, um, and, uh, I, and on the y-axis we got the number of words per annotation uh, on average for that student, and we find this fairly sort of, you know, it's, there isn't a big variance that if you're just annotating a lot of short, so 40 words per annotation was what, around what these students were doing, regardless of whether they were writing many or few annotations. Um, and then, you know, this is just some of the metrics that I was able to calculate based on the annotations themselves, but then I also surveyed them to try to get a sense of, do they think it's helping them to learn, right? I didn't actually measure, I was actually quite interested in hearing that there was an NSF study to try to measure, for example, how effective these things are in helping to learn, but I thought it's important to uh, at least get the student's sense of how uh, much it helps them. Uh, so one thing is that, you know, asking them, does your annotating enhance your learning? Students on a four to seven scale are slightly on the positive side, right? So they tend to, they, and this is the blue is the midterm and the green is the final. Uh, same students just asked at two different time points. Um, there's not that much uh, change, but you find they're just on the positive side. They're also not saying that this is, you know, a seven uh, in terms of helping them to learn. Um, do they like doing it? So, you know, I asked them if they found the, in the readings interesting because I felt like this would probably uh, you know, somehow affect, if they're not finding the readings interesting, they're probably not going to find annotating them interesting. And so they're saying, you know, between five and six out of seven uh, of, uh, that it, they're interesting. Um, but then when I asked them, do you find yourself annotating because mostly for marks or mostly for other reasons, uh, they're more uh, slightly on the negative side, right? So you actually get quite a big spread if you look at the, uh, you know, the outliers there the, the, um, and the quartiles. You see that it, you know, it varies the, uh, from all the way from one to seven on the, on the answers. Uh, but they tend to be slightly on the, with a median on the, slightly on the negative side, negative being doing it a little bit more for grades. So this is something that I think really requires a little bit more work in how to motivate it properly for them to want to do it. Since they said it helps them learn, why are they not then annotating because of that motivation as opposed to just because I'm grading it for it? Um, but if you ask them how much they enjoy using Hypothesis, then now we're back onto the positive side of the scale, right? And it's with a median of five, right? So that's, uh, um, uh, so the, the use of the Hypothesis is enjoyable, but they're still doing it mostly just because I was giving them an online participation grade based entirely on their annotations. And then just last uh, bit of sort of statistics, 
I did a qualitative assessment of their annotations on a week-to-week -week basis. On a scale of one to five, I graded them. Uh, five being they made a very meaningful contribution. So this, I was trying really hard not to base it on how many annotations they made, but rather on how good their contributions were. And what I found is that, you know, first of all, if that's the bar graph on the, on the left-hand side. You can see uh, it's sort of a, a bimodal distribution, where some students were sort of middling in the quality of the annotations, or students were sort of consistently good from week to week and making really strong contributions. Um, and so that's sort of an interesting um, distribution. All the students that were annotating were making decent contributions, right? So that's, they're all sort of in the two and a half to three, uh, but then some students were really in the four and a half to five I, on average per week. And then what I did is just correlated that to the number of annotations to say, could I save myself the trouble of trying to assess them in a qualitative way, which is actually required me sort of every on a week to week basis uh, evaluating these. And I just correlated that with the number of annotations. And you do find that there's a positive correlation between the students that are good at annotating are doing more annotating. Um, and it's just that there's, there's something about how much they're engaging with the text. And so there's something there around um, trying to figure out what are the ways of getting those students that are not annotating so much to also want to participate. So just in, to sum up a little bit, what are a couple of things that work well? Um, work really well, I think, that most students do seem to engage well with the texts, right? I think the students were there week to week doing things and contributing and reading through all the way to the end and making some contributions. Students are reporting that the annotations are helping them to learn. So that's, again, uh, something that I'm hoping to study in much more detail to see if we can actually measure that effectiveness in a concrete way. Um, and it really helped me from the perspective of the person that was in charge of running the seminar on a week-to-week -week basis to see those annotations. So I think those are three of the, the core things that I really liked about the, this experience over the last three years. What I think didn't, need, still needs work is that I think I don't like the idea, it doesn't sit right with me that the idea that they're annotating because I'm grading them for it. And I, and I really want to experiment with different ways of explaining and, 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 uh, and presenting the role of annotation so that they want to annotate because they're finding value in it. I think I, I, I must not be doing something right if they're still reporting that they're just doing it as part of doing school as opposed to as part of actually wanting to do something. It's a big challenge in all kinds of things as, uh, as instructors we find, but I want to get through that with annotations. And the second thing was just something that I was really trying to do with this project was to figure out how to get students to go back to the text multiple times. I started building a notification system to try to encourage students to go back to a text after they'd annotated it. So go back a week later, go back if they, they were the first one to annotate, after there was five more students that came and annotated it, they should be going back to read and engage in that discussion. When I measured that, it turned out very few students did that. And sending them a notification wasn't really working and getting them to do that. So that's something that I still think I want to figure out how to work on. And there's a bunch of other things that I want to try sort of experimenting in different ways. One is assessing uh, various aspects of learning. I think asking the students if they're finding it helpful is one thing, but I think we actually need to try to measure it in some more concrete ways to see how helpful are annotations in helping students to understand the course context, how helpful are annotations in getting them to be good critical readers, and how helpful, uh, how can we try to measure the quality of their annotations in a way that isn't, um, or in a way that to see if they get better at annotating over time, because having, being a good annotator seems like a valuable skill as well as experimenting with additional features like other kinds of annotations, as well as having a like button, other things that might get the students to want to be annotating and to get better at annotating. So on the, on, uh, overall, this is, again, these are just some stats from just one classroom. Next year, I'm going to be running this across a whole bunch of classrooms at Simon Fraser University. Um, and the idea is to try to see if we can pull out some lessons that will be useful for all instructors that are trying to bring annotations to their classrooms. Thank you. Uh, greetings, comrades, co-conspirators. Uh, I bring you welcomes from the hardworking students of San Francisco State, the hardworking faculty and staff. Um, uh, this semester I'm teaching a course called The Literature of Labor, and this past week we've been discussing a movie uh, called Sleep Dealer, uh, directed by Alex Rivera, uh, 2008. Has anybody seen Sleep Dealer? No? Oh my goodness, it's an independent movie. Uh, it's gotten, been getting more buzz in the past uh, couple of years. Sleep Dealer is about a movie about a young uh, man who lives in Oaxaca, uh, Mexico, and for various reasons has to move to uh, Tijuana, 
uh, and it's set in the not so distant future, and he works in a virtual maquiladora, you know, the factories uh, on the border. And it's a fascinating movie about uh, digital labor, uh, etc. And most importantly, um, it's a really interesting treatment of uh, the border, which of course, as we know, is a very uh, uh, lively topic these days as well. Um, and the way in which uh, borders both connect uh, and separate, uh, the ways in which borders are uh, potentially uh, sites of violence, uh, the ways in which borders are uh, figures and uh, very material instances of exclusion. But the thing I like about Sleep Dealer, the movie, and you're probably asking yourselves, why the hell is this guy talking about some movie nobody's ever heard about or seen? Uh, one of the reasons why I like the movie is because it's also about how borders uh, can be uh, places of incredible creativity, uh, hybridized and uh, variegated identities and experiences, um, and how borders can also foster new solidarities uh, between those who have been divided uh, and whatnot. And how borders can, you know, without borders you can't really have, for instance, hacking uh, as a cultural and perhaps even a technological uh, trope. Now why am I telling you about this? Uh, because I think one way I like to think about digital annotations or web annotations uh, is in terms of borders. That is, annotation, uh, online annotation, I use Hypothesis as a plugin uh, in WordPress. Annotation creates a border uh, between a text and another text, or a text and another voice. In this case, in my case, students' voices or students' writing. Um, we often think of annotation in terms of a kind of very hierarchical, or you know, often hierarchical kind of model where the annotation is subservient to the primary text or is an adjunct to the primary text. But what I'd like to, uh, to propose uh, to you today is that we think about annotation as really creating this interface uh, between two different texts and an interface that in and of itself can be an extraordinary uh, and fascinating and productive site of creativity um, and knowledge and whatnot. Okay, um, so I have four theses or four ways perhaps of thinking about annotation in these, ter uh, in these terms. One is annotation makes visible in new and more social ways the ways in which meaning is a provisional collaboration between readers and texts rather than something to be discovered lurking deep within texts. This is important, right, because students and readers generally think that there is the text and somewhere beneath the text is the meaning of the text. And yet I think one thing that annotation can uh, do, uh, or make visible at least, is the process or, or meaning as a process, right? Meaning as a collaborative process constitutively, not as, you know, here's a book and now we're going to read it and discuss it, but in fact the actual meaning of that book, that narrative, that story, depends on this uh, communicative and collaborative dialogical process. So I'm just showing you an example here. This is uh, uh, from one of my classes, I think last semester, or this semester rather, uh, where the students start engaging in this. Uh, you can see Maureen over here on the right. How many of you have read The Yellow Wallpaper? Charlotte Perkins, what a great story. It's like, you know, the, you, have you seen the movie The Grudge? Grudge, you know, the Japanese horror flick? Thank you. Uh, or Crimson Peak, you've seen Crimson Peak, the Del Toro movie? Okay, how many of you have seen a goddamn Haunted House movie? <laughs> Raise your hands if you've seen any Haunted House movie. Thank you, okay. So then you must read Charlotte Perkins, Gilman, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper because it is like one of the greatest haunted house stories, ghost stories, and it's very short too, by the way, um, uh, in American literature. In any case, so here you can see Maureen says, John is obviously the antagonist in The Yellow Wallpaper. This is a very important and kind of controversial way of reading the story, and this then produces this dialogue amongst the students about what does it mean you know, to be the protagonist, how does the story work? So in other words, the meaning of the story is not there in the text, it's in this process of the students collaborating, uh, talking together and working together. All right, uh, I'm gonna give you one more idea, I'm gonna give you two, try and give you two more if I don't run out of time. Um, okay, online um, annotation re, uh, revisualizes in powerful ways the reality of text as palimpsest of writing and reading. 
That is, a palimpsest is a text that's written on top of another text, right? Like a blackboard that's been written on and their race written on, etc. That is, reading creates what I call surtexts, strange interfaces or frontiers where new roles and meanings are fabricated. Thus, confusing dichotomies like writer versus reader, creator versus interpreter, host versus parasite. You know, because this is a very common way in which we think about texts in, at least in literature or in, in schools, is that the students are kind of the parasites uh, on these texts which are the hosts. And you've all seen Alien? Or how, how many of you are watching Fortitude, the new series? Don't you watch like, yeah, who the hell, where am I? Anyways. <laughs> So, so just to give you a really, what is going on with this? Uh, just to give you a really brief example, here's Edna St. Vincent Millay, a very famous American poet, and she has this sonnet called Love Is Not All, and it's basically an anti-romantic sonnet, which is quite radical given that, you know, most sonnets we think of as being very romantic, and especially given that it's written by a woman, right? Uh, especially that it's written by a woman, uh, you know, in the first half of the century. So I asked my students to visually annotate the poem. Right, that is to throw up images that somehow uh, respond to the poem, capture their interpretation, etc. I just want to draw your attention for the moment to the one on the right. All you need is love, false, the four basic human necessities are air, water, food, and shelter. And this is a fellow from that show, The Office, isn't he? What's his name? I can't remember his name. Dwight. 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 This is Dwight from The Office. Right? So all I want to point, you know, kind of point you to here is look at the really interesting intersection of three different historical and textual moments here, right? One is The Office with Dwight, uh, which is a television sitcom from what, the 90s? The 2000s? The 2000s, thank you. Uh, the other one is The Beatles, right? Isn't that The Beatles? All you need is love, doo -doo 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 -doo, right? And that's what, from the 1960s or 70s? I don't know. Huh? Okay. And then we have the, Saint Vince, the Malay poem, which is from the 1920s, 30s. Right? And so this is a kind of annotation that works as an inter, assembles an intertext. And what, so what? You're like, whatever, you know, it's cute. The, these memes are all over the place, whatever. Uh, but I think one thing this can help in the classroom, for instance, is to show how the idea of love is a cultural trope. You know, love doesn't mean anything except how a culture defines and writes the stories around love. Whether that's Dwight, whether that's the Beatles, in the 1960s, whether it's Malay on the 1920s or 30s. So that intertextual, <coughs> the surtext that's created here is really a surtext that is concerned with love as a kind of cultural narrative or cultural trope and the historical meanings uh, thereof. I'll just show you one more, which I happen to like a lot. I just want to hear Sierra Moreno's uh, uh, visual annotation of the uh, uh, Love is Not All poem, in which she really picks up on the anti-romance and presents this woman image, really casts the poem kind of the, as a you know, dangerous poem, or the woman uh, taking up this kind of dangerous uh, position in relation to uh, love and whatnot. All right, let me move on to my third one. Online annotation submits written text to a whole new ecology of signification, visual and sonic creativity, thus provoking new meanings and pleasures and subverting the notion that texts, especially literary texts, are monumental or transcendent. The experience of meaning is always profane and historical, not canonical and timeless. And uh, I think this is my example. Oh no, that's not it. This is it. So again, this is a William Carlos Williams poem to Elsie, which is a really wonderful, beautiful poem. Uh, but the point is, again, I asked the students to do a kind of inter, uh, visual as well as kind of uh, intertextual uh, annotating of the poem, etc. And you can see that what they do is they, in order to make sense of the poem and to explain the poem to themselves and to their comrades, they draw on all these different contexts, right? Visual context, literary, cinematic, etc. And so many of them are not, it's not Shakespeare. They're not referring back to Shakespeare, right? They're bringing this poem into a context which is quite either, you know, typically quite contemporary and also popular. So these annotations also repre represent a zone where the canonical, the sacred, the transcendent, the literary comes into contact with and bathes in uh, the profane, the common, uh, and the multitudinous uh, everyday kind of culture. And that's really important for the students in terms of finding a way to inhabit 
uh, these poems, the realm of literature uh, and culture, etc. Okay, and finally, uh, online annotation and acts interpretation as a social, as social, not as a gift of authority. Text and writing are means to conviviality and community, outposts of a cooperative commonwealth, rather than exercises in subordination and authority. And uh, And this is Ginsburg's Howl, which of course was uh, first performed here in San Francisco uh, many, many, uh, four to five decades, six, six, six decades, oh my God, six decades now. Um, and I'm just putting this up here to give you a sense of how uh, the students, when the students work with texts or you know, materials uh, through annotation, the one thing that happens on the border between student and text uh, is that they realize that texts are not something to be, you know, to kneel before. The texts are not something that are powerful, and nor are the people who are in charge of those texts, like teachers, uh, powerful, priestly, etc. Uh, but in fact, that you know, they can play as much of a role uh, in understanding and meaning those texts as a teacher or delegated authority, uh, etc. Okay. And finally, I'll just close with this. Uh, I have a whole thing in here about unlearning, that students need to unlearn as much as they need to learn. But I'd like to close with this quote by Kenneth Burke, who is a somewhat famous, more famous than sleep dealer, uh, American, American <laughs> cultural critic, uh, who never lived in a haunted house. Um, but anyways, <laughs> this is a quote that uh, Kenneth Burke used as a metaphor for learning, which I happen to like a lot. Quote, Imagine you, you, that you enter a parlor, you come late. When you arrive, others have long preceded you, and they are engaged in a heated discussion, a discussion too heated for them to pause and tell you exactly what it is about. In fact, the discussion had already begun long before any of them got there, so that no one present is qualified to retrace for you all the steps that had gone before you. You listen for a while until you decide that you have caught the tenor of the argument, then you put in your oar. Someone answers, you answer him, another comes to your defense, another aligns himself against you to either the embarrassment or gratification of your opponent, depending on the quality of your ally's assistance. However, the discussion is interminable. The hour grows late, you must depart. And you do depart, with the discussion still vigorously in progress. That is, I think, one thing that the uh, web or online annotation has helped me to do is to make my classroom uh, more like a really kick-ass cocktail party, uh, which is what Burke is describing. Thank you. Thanks again, Larry. All right, hi everybody. I'm sorry for my prepubescent Kathleen Turner voice today. I have a bit of a cold, um, but I will do my best here. So yeah, as he said, I. I started doing annotations in the classroom about nine or ten years ago, eight, eight nine years ago. Um, and my students, you know, we would, we would gather around and I would say, let's discuss this chapter of the book. And the reaction was much like, you know, have you seen Alien? And you guys all looked like, blink, 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 no. Um, and so I was really frustrated. And I thought, you know, I have this student base that is not necessarily terribly motivated to read or engage with the text naturally, but they are terribly motivated to get a grade from me. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, I can at least get them to uh, get a grade for their annotations as motivation, and then that would fuel our discussions. Um, and as some of the other panelists have stated already, uh, I now use those annotations to personalize the discussions that we have. I can easily grab them, whether they're digital or flip through their books and find something um, to actually address something. Um, it, it drives the lesson. It makes it student-centered so that um, they're, they're truly leading what we're, what we're talking about. Um, and it also sort of pushes them to think, you know, beyond the surface level. When you're talking about high school English, even I teach, you know, AP English composition, and even those students, uh, you know, they have to be really pushed to get into the deep, you know, analysis of it rather than just the surface level stuff. So it sort of pushed them to do that. Um, the other thing that it does, I feel, for the public school classroom, which is a big buzzword, is that it differentiates itself. 
Um, and so we at the K through 12 level are always encouraged to be differentiating for our students, whatever level that they're coming at us with. And um, that can be uh, terribly challenging when you're pulled in many directions with 35 students every hour. Um, but reading is, and annotating a text can, I think, be, it naturally differentiates itself. Students who absolutely do not understand something can start at the very basic level of summarization, and students that are actually, you know, almost in this college level sphere are more, working more at, you know, deep rhetorical analysis of, you know, diction and tone and whatnot. So I started very, very old school. Uh, in, the, in the public school classroom, even here in the Silicon Valley and all around the Bay Area, you will be shocked when you enter a public school classroom and find the lack of technology. Um, I, I work in a pretty affluent public school district and, and have for quite some time. And even they uh, do not have one-to-one -one devices. So look at this pile of annotations at the end that they pulled out. Uh, if they will not digitally annotate for me, or if, I, if they won't purchase a book for God forbid, um, they, uh, they end up in, in uh, having all these post-its at the end, which I cry about when they pull out. But, okay, so one thing that I, I found um, when I moved to digital annotation was that it became sort of this living document that everyone's talking about. Um, and that it increased their engagement and that they found like they were a part of it. Um, and a, a huge part for me also is that I don't like teaching things that are um, not relevant today, which I think is rare, but um, high school students often need to be led to see the connections. You know, nothing kills me more than when they say, this is so irrelevant, I don't understand how To Kill a Mockingbird has any relevance today. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> I started a while ago with notability. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, and I would have them, you know, annotating everything on there. Um, and then I started getting really desperate and asking them to Snapchat things, uh, <laughs> take pictures of it, put your comments on it, um, using Padlet in the classroom so it would sort of start to incur like devolve with our discussion. Um, I've used, you know, a couple of other platforms. Slate had a really good, has done a couple of really cool things where they've already annotated text. Um, you know, of course, Genius has Proof Rock on there and, and lots of other things. So I'll sometimes ask them to sort of engage with things that have already been annotated. And then um, the previous panelists talked about how they're taking. Um, doing visual annotations, which I really love as well, but another big thing that's really important to me is um, bringing in the current news, something that's current. So my students are reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and they're connecting this with sort of the ethics of science that is happening today. And they're, these are things that they've annotated with images and with um, links to other articles. And then this was with, um, this is using Hypothesis to look at um, a satire from Twain right before getting into Huckleberry Finn. So it, it does help, I think, with the students with engagement. I think um, some things that when you're thinking about developing things for the K through 12 classroom, you really have to think about how fast can it be implemented, um, how, uh, is there some sort of an analog version that you can like quickly go to if the digital's not gonna work, I think? Um, you know, is it cheap, is it free? Uh, I oftentimes have my students, the only thing that we have in class to work with would be their phones. So if it has an iOS component or something, they're more likely to be able to engage with it on a regular basis. Um, and I think as long as it's something that is really getting them to engage with the text, the richness of the text, um, and it's not um, stripping that away, it's not providing them for kind of like an easy out, it's really getting them to think about it, go deeper. Um, we, we in the secondary classroom, I think, are very interested in that. So that is, that is all for me. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Remy.
Um, so, as Remy said, my name is Brian Lukow. I'm the co-founder of Perusal. Um, this is a, a collaboration. My, my partners um, are, they, they also teach, um, they are in the physics and political science department at Harvard. Um, Eric Mazur, Gary King, Kelly Miller. And we all sort of come to this from a similar um, problem, which is, you know, how do we get students to actually do the reading? So I want to talk about the problem a little bit, talk about what we've developed to, to solve it, and then talk about some research we've done into engagement and effectiveness of the, of the platform in, in helping students um, engage with the reading and also in, improve their learning. So really the, the problem that we find is that you know, we assign reading to our students, very carefully selected. We're hoping they're going to do it before they come to class so we can spend class time on the really tough stuff. And students just, just don't do it. Um, and sometimes they, they don't do it because they don't think it's important. They don't think it's a necessary part of the course. They think they can just come to class and get by without it. Um, sometimes they have, they, they intend to do it and they get, they start working on it and they get, they get stuck somewhere um, and they're, they're sitting by themselves in their room and they're trying to understand this, this complex material. Um, and sometimes it, it, there are some students out there who just don't do anything, you know, there, there's no grade associated with that, you know, with, which, which one also found. Um, so what we've done is to try to build a platform to motivate students to read in a couple different ways. Um, you know, one, we want to leverage the social to get students better motivated. Um, you know, students enjoy interacting with each other just like any, any human beings do, but in particular, students enjoy interacting online socially. Um, so we've, we've tried to build those sorts of social features into this platform that's built on annotation. We also want to motivate students extrinsically with, with grades, um, but with the realization that it's, it's, it's very difficult to do that at any kind of scale. Um, so what we've tried to do is to build a platform that is accessible to students, doesn't require a lot of, of training for students to understand how to, how to get, get started, and is also zero overhead um, for the instructor. So you know, most of the instructors that, that we work with, with, through, um, in, with our platform are not necessarily interested in annotation per se. It's more of a means to an end to get students to come to class prepared. And so those folks don't necessarily have time or the inclination to want to to participate in, in discussions or, or read through things online or, or do grading of student work. So we, we needed to develop something that was completely automated um, and, and very, uh, with a very low barrier to entry. And so what we've tried to do is to build something based on annotation, because we know how well that, that can work, but strip it down as much as possible. Um, so that it's, it's very simple, very simple for students to get going with. Um, this is what it looks like from a student perspective. Um, so from the student perspective, you, you're seeing conversations on the right. These are annotations, and they're annotation threads, just like in, in Hypothesis or any, any sort of annotation platform. But it's, it's completely stripped down just to the, the text. There's no, there's no tagging or, or grouping or any, 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 anything like that. Um, just a, it's a conversation. To the, the, to the students, it feels like, like chat. Um, and we try to make it as much as possible feel like a social network. So students can see, if you look at the upper right, they can see the avatars of who other folks who are logged on at the same time. Certain things other people say will show up as little talk bubbles coming out of that, that person. Um, anything that, that their peers do at the, while they're reading um, will show up in, the, in, in real time. Um, so when students are online the night before trying to prepare for class the next day, they'll see stuff appear in, in real time. Um, all they do is just select something, let, let the mouse go, and a conversation will start. Uh, they, they don't have to say to, to do anything else in particular. Just type something in, hit enter, it, it adds to the conversation. And we've also tried to add some, some things to make it feel like a social network to students. So if you look at the, the little uh, the thread on the top, you're seeing that, that orange um, question mark. So that, that was flagged as a question, and if the student clicks that question mark, it, it indicates that they have the same question as the person that asks that question. So in some sense, students are upvoting questions they find particularly salient. Um, if there's a particular response they like, they can click that green check mark um, on the, the right, which indicates that that particular comment was really helpful and helped their understanding. So to help their peers try to zero in on comments that were particularly useful. And so what we're trying to do is to put students in a mindset of this is, this is your space, this is a place for you to, to help each other better understand the material. So we say, what we say to students is, look, as you're reading, if you see something you're confused about, highlight it, ask a question. 
if you see something that, that, that a friend is, has, um, has uh, said and you think you can um, help answer their question or elaborate on it, then respond to it, help them out. Um, so we're trying to build a, a, a community where students are really helping each other. Um, all this works similarly to how a social network would work. So if I ask a question and someone responds to it, I'll get a notification of that. Um, I'll even get an email notification. I can reply to that email within my email client. That reply gets posted right back to the right thread within, within Perusal. Um, I can mention a friend in my post. That friend will get, get notified. We're trying to bring students as much as possible back into the text as many times as possible. So they're not just reading and doing some sort of activity once. They're coming back and engaging over and over again so that when they come to class, they've really had time to dig into this stuff um, with both by themselves and, and also together with their peers. So this is what it looks like. It's, you know, it, it's try to, it can do, you know, fun little things like put emoji in, um, which students like to do. I can put some, some math into my, uh, my comment, hit enter. It, it, gets, it gets posted. We try to figure out if they're asking a question or not and tag it as a question if, if we can. Um, so again, it's, it's, just, it's, it's an annotation platform, but we try to stream, streamline it as much as possible and add social features to make it feel like a, a social network. So this is also self-moderating. As I said at the beginning, we're, we don't want to give the bill, we, we don't want to send the, the instructor a bill for their time by adopting this platform. So students moderate the, the platform um, themselves. Um, a student can flag a particular comment if it's inappropriate or if, they, if it's plagiarized from somewhere, and that, 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 that good comment gets, gets um, hidden from the other students. Um, so instructors don't need to, to be constantly moderating or, or monitoring the platform. What we then do is we aggregate all of the comments and questions together to give the instructor a sense of what's happening with their students. What are the things their students are asking about? What are their students confused about? Most instructors, particularly instructors who use this in a large class, don't have time to sit down and read all of the comments and questions that students have made. It's just, it's just too much data. So we have this, what we call a confusion report, which is automatically generated, and it clusters the different questions together that students are asking and gives the instructor a sense of what should I be focusing on in, in class. Um, so what you're looking at here is a sample confusion report. You can see it's, it, the questions have been clustered into various topics that are of related questions. And within each topic, we give the instructor a sense of a few exemplar questions that exemplify the kinds of things students are asking about in that topic. And those little numbers, a little hard to see, but to the right of the question, those tell the instructor how many other students said this question was one that I really want to know the answer to. And so what we encourage instructors to do, which can be really powerful, is to take the questions from the confusion report, pull them into their own their slides when they're going to teach in class the next day, and actually frame class time around these questions. So come into class, say to students, hey, um, Emily or whoever, or maybe even not even name the person, um, had a great question in perusal last night. Um, you know, she asked X, Y, Z. Now let's talk about it. Let me, I'm going to give you a mini lecture on it, or maybe I'll do an active learning activity. Um, but it creates a really nice positive feedback loop for students because they start to see that the questions they ask will actually Im influence what happens in class, and that'll motivate them to, to read more deeply as well. Um, and from the instructor's perspective, they don't, they don't need to, to monitor things. They can just pull up this report um, as they're preparing for class. We, to, you know, to keep students accountable and to, to get students to do this, the social is motivating and that creates an intrinsic motivation. But we also, as I said before, we have an extrinsic motiva motivator as well, which are the grades that students get for, for doing this work. And what we've tried to do is not just to account for the volume of what they're doing, but also account for the, the, the quality. Um, so the quality is it's fully automated um, scoring. So we've developed a machine learning algorithm that automatically assesses the quality of what students have, have, have written for their questions and their comments. Um, and it, we've, we've actually found is that we can give scores that agree, automatically that agree with a human's scores as often as two humans would, two humans would agree with each other. Um, so the, so the, the scoring actually matches up quite well with the scores that a human would give. Um, so we, in, we, we grade each comment or question automatically based on the quality. 
We also grade based on the quantity. So typically instructors will say, I need you to, to make at least three comments or five comments or seven comments on this assignment. And they can be questions, they can be answers, they can be elaborations. Um, you know, we, we can set a deadline, we can give credit for late work. And then we also look at the distribution of the comments across the, the chapter because sometimes what will happen is students will put in a lot of work on the first few pages of the chapter and then kind of you know, drop off and just skim the rest. So we, through the grading, we encourage students to distribute what they're doing throughout the whole chapter so they're really engaging through all the material. So let me just close by sharing some, some results that we found in our research about how well this actually works. So we, we did a study where we had a, a, a physics course at, at Harvard. Um, we, the students used perusal for two consecutive um, semesters in the fall of 2015 in the spring of 2016. So what you're seeing here is a, a graph of, of how many assignments the students missed. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is, is at, at a base level, actually get the students to, to do the reading. So here we're just, we, we're, we're noting that almost all the students did almost all the assignments. You know, you, you, typically students are gonna occasionally miss, you know, one or two reading assignments for various reasons, personal reasons, whatnot. Um, but the vast majority of students are doing the vast majority of, of the assignments. And just as a, as a check, because you know, sometimes you, know, you might think Harvard students aren't necessarily representative of, of typical students, we also had a course at um, University of Central Florida that used perusal in the spring of 2016. Um, and we, we, we have their data here as that third bar. Um, and it's a similar pattern. So we're, we are really getting students to do the, the work, whether they're at Harvard or, or Central Florida or, or wherever. It, it is the, both the intrinsic and extrinsic combined are, um, are really motivating students to actually engage in, and, and do the reading. And they're not just opening it up. Um, we can also track through, through perusal how much students are, are students actually reading through, through the entire chapter. Um, and they, they really are. Um, so you, what you can see here is the, the vast majority of students are doing either you know, all of the, the, the reading or, the, or really the vast majority of it. Um, and you know, very few students are, are just you know, reading parts of, of, of the chapter. So that, that gives us a lot of, of confidence. Um, and then let me just close with an assessment of, of the impact on learning outcomes, because that's really our, our, our real goal. I mean, we're trying to get students to do the reading. We think the reading is useful in and of itself, but the, the, the main point of it is to help students better improve their understanding of the course material. Um, and we find that it, re it really does. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, comparisons between the, the course where, where we used perusal and a previous version of the course that also used an annotation tool, but not um, this, this new uh, software that, we, that we've developed. Um, so the light, bar on the light bars on the left are showing the version of the course where we used a, 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 pre, a different annotation tool. The dark bars are, are the, the, is the version of the course where we used perusal. Um, and each, in the fall and the spring, we had five exams in each course. And there's a pretty consistent pattern of uh, seeing improved exam scores um, between uh, the first iteration and the second iteration of, of, of this course. Um, which gives us confidence that we're, we're seeing um, effectiveness not just in the fact that students are actually doing the reading, but this is carrying all the way through to their, their exam performance, indicating that it really does help their understanding of the course material. So let me close there. Um, I'd love to talk with you more about this or about um, any kind of annotation. Um, here's my, my contact info, so feel free to stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks again. I think we've got a few minutes maybe for questions, if there are questions for the panel. So it looks like Nate's got a microphone, and if folks want to come on up, um, welcome to Ask Away. It looks like we've got a few people. Hey, guys. Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, so I've looked at uh, doing some pilots and stuff with uh, schools, but uh, I've bumped into at least Below the college level, there is some legal requirement not to put student work out in the public. Can you guys just tell all of us about that so we can know what the real story is when we try and do what you guys are doing? Actually, I had a very similar question. Um, our general counsel has actually asked me to figure out um, how to handle uh, the copyright, not the student record, the FERPA part for American, and I know you're probably teaching in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but for the American teachers, um, 
you know, we know what our um, exceptions are for in-classroom use, but the minute it leaves the classroom and it goes up on the web or on any platform. Um, so I don't know if your quest the previous question was FERPA or copyright. In other words, is it a student record and why are we sharing student records with other students? But my question was about the copyright part because that's we're not as worried about the FERPA. Um, and we actually had the general counsel actually asked the library to create an agreement uh, because the IP policy for Caltech would say the students own their copyright. So um, the exceptions in American law would say as long as it's in classroom use, we don't need to do anything. But the minute it would be shared beyond, we would need them to either license their work uh, under a, or waive their rights or do, a, a, do a, some kind of a permission. So I don't know if that relates to the prior question. Where are you? Uh, copyright and FERPA? OK, copyright and FERPA, at least if you're in the US. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say really quickly about your question at the secondary level. I would imagine that it would have to be some kind of a student waiver the same way that if you take a photo of them, they have to give, like their parents have to create a waiver. But uh, I can't give you like a specific ed code um, answer to that. It's way above my uh, pay grade. <laughs> Yes, maybe I can comment on the, the second question about um, about content. So what we've we've intentionally tried to design our platform as a, a closed system in the sense that any 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 comments that students make are only shared with other students in their in their class. It, it, they're not they're not publicly accessible. Um, we we what, what we do to to get content to the system is we we work with with um, publishers to deliver their ebooks through our platform so students can buy buy the book through us and then. Um, access the book within our system and use all of the, the social um, commenting tools. Um, and instructors can also upload their own materials. But all that, all of the materials that are that are uploaded by the instructor are only viewable to others in in that in that course. So the instructor is not uploading things to a, to a public space. Um, so that, that that's how we've we've addressed those sorts of, of issues. In Canada, we have other, uh, the, the regulations are a little different, but we have, for example, all these rules around uh, not hosting any student content uh, or any student information on U.S. servers. And everything has to be hosted within Canada to keep, uh, you know, so that you guys can't, or your government can't uh, come in and just you know, request any information about the students. And so, but my approach to all of this has been to, I, you know, if I was to take this all into a private space, it would undermine all of my motivations for doing this work, which is about having the students be engaging out with the public. Um, and so I don't have, and I somehow maybe slightly purposefully haven't inquired too much about what are the actual obligations. And I, what I tend to do is just I ask the students to do this, and they don't, they haven't pushed back on putting, uh, especially with the annotations. Some of them push back around publishing their content, their essays publicly, but it, that's because they are embarrassed about what they write. And so then I try to tell them that if they don't feel good about it, they shouldn't be putting it out, they shouldn't be submitting it to me in the first place. But I don't know the actual answer, but I think it's important for us to try to push those boundaries a little bit, because if we are having the students not engage with the world, then we're undermining the public role of universities and the public mission of universities. It's about having the students engage with content that's out in the world. That's, for me, the most uh, fundamental thing. And so whatever the regulations that would be there to be a barrier to that, I would want to push against. Well, I actually have a question. <laughs> if you don't mind, did you want to answer that one too, Ramey? Yeah, let me just very briefly say, so at the K-12 level with FERPA concerns, that's a significant issue that I think is one best navigated in conversation with Jeremy. I don't want to put him on the spot, or <laughs> but I know that Jeremy does a lot of work as SFI with K-12 districts, and there are many ways to respect uh, what is legally obligated as well as district policy. And we have, uh, in some work that's been done, work at other, either individual schools or district-wide where there are partnership models in place to ensure that K-12 students can safely and privately engage in these rich annotation conversations and do so within the bounds of, of, of what policy they are legally obligated to follow. So it's possible, but again, it's, I think, a deeper conversation uh, to go into. Just wanted to mention that. So um, 
a, a lot of you spoke very eloquently of how annotation has enabled your students to um, engage much more and connect more deeply with text. You've also, in several ways, talked about how uh, annotation has enabled the students to engage on a human-to-human -human level more deeply, both with you as teachers and with each other as students. And so uh, I know earlier, it was yesterday at some point, somebody asked about the human-to-human -human changes and connections that are made through annotation as opposed to the human-machine or human-text connections. And I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if you would either uh, place a significant amount of the value of annotation in what it does at, at the human level uh, between humans, or if you primarily see the value as being between the students and the text itself. Or maybe it's not either or. Um, there are many human to human relations in a classroom, obviously. Uh, and certainly one is between the teacher and the students. So the annotation is extremely important to me um, in terms of getting to know that student, in terms of, you know, for instance, using the annotation in the classroom to let the student know uh, that I know what he or she is thinking and reading about, et cetera, or to ask the students to lead the class. You know what I mean? Like if there's a really great annotation on a really difficult poem, I'll say, hey, Maureen, you said this. Why don't you, you know what I mean? So that's a human to human. I think in terms of the student-to-student -student kind of relation, it's a little bit harder to put your finger on. I think the use of annotations, or at least my experience, is that it does create a real sense of uh, collectivity uh, amongst the students on the page, so to speak, that then, you know what I mean, really changes the tenor of the classroom uh, as well. And I don't have any data or whatnot, but I can say before, kind of using online annotation. It took a while to get the students, you know, past the kind of, I'm looking at you, teacher, not at the person to the left or right of me. Um, and now with uh, using the online web annotation or whatnot, that community, communal uh, relation really, I think, gets going a lot uh, faster and, and becomes deeper. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say also it's, uh, students can be really hesitant to speak up sometimes and to be not exactly the expert, but to voice what they have to say in opposition or just uh, in addition to what you have to say. And so it kind of starts a chain reaction of, okay, we, we have some knowledge here, we're building some knowledge. Uh, when they see that each other, they, they have something to say about it. There's a little bit of like a piling on effect there. I mean, there's also human, you know, talking human to human, there's also the generational benefits. They might, they're gonna see connections that uh, we don't all see just from, you know, cultural touchstones and things like that that bring some of the connections that, you know, he was talking about in terms of the images and, and, and all, all of these cross-cultural connections that they're making to the one text. I, I, I think that, that human-human connection is, is, is the most important um, th thing that we're going after. One of the things that we've, we now suggest to instructors is to avoid jumping into the conversations that students are having. It's, it can be tempting as an instructor to, to look at what students have been writing and, and, and say, wow, there's a, uh, there's a question um, I could answer that question really well. Let me just answer it right now. And you've answered, maybe you answered the student's question, but once, once I'd start jumping in, now other students may be more reluctant to, to, to jump in because they're gonna wait for, for me or for the, whoever the instructor is to respond. Um, and so it, ha letting students keep the space as their space, I think helps foster those sorts of connections. Cool. Um, I have a question also about the involvement of humans. Um, but yeah, so Juan Pablo and Brian both mentioned you know, different methods for grading quality and kind of assessing the quality of annotations. Um, so yeah, I wondered if you could speak a bit more about that and specifically um, like how the human teacher fits in. Uh, I mean, I, I have an approach to teaching which the students sometimes push, a lot, push against a lot because I try to not lay out any specific parameters about anything. And so it's my, I don't tell them how long their essays have to be, I don't give them a minimum number of annotations that they have to make, I don't tell them, I give them a set of 
10 different kinds of things that they might want to annotate about. So you might want to declare, like you know, I tell them, you might want to define a term that you had to look up and just put that definition so it's there. You might want to link out to some additional resource. You might want to ask a question. You might want to answer a question. So I give them some broad, very broad parameters and I try to not prescribe what it is that they should be doing on that text. Um, the students sometimes just want to be told, you should, how, many, how many is the right number of annotations, right? They want to know how long the essay needs to be, how many words, like they want to know how many links they should be in, how many reference. They want to know all these things, even at the graduate, at the master's student level, uh, which for me is incredibly frustrating because I want to give them the creativity and I'm trying to open up a space where they can be creative and where I'm then willing to value all kinds of contributions that I might have not anticipated, right? And so this is where I, I, you know, been trying to think about how am I, what are different ways for me to provide them feedback and uh, in terms of what, so, so I continue to encourage things that I think are make, making a valuable contribution. At the end of the day, that what's a valuable contribution ends up being a subjective thing that I'm sort of passing judgment on as I'm looking through. I'm like, yes, this is contributing to the discourse. Or look, this generated some effect. And so, it's something I'm still, even though I've, after three years, I'm still struggling to figure out what's the way of communicating this to the students, of what, I, in this keeping things vague, but still communicating both expectations and then having some sense of fairness around if I'm going to pass judgment, because I do need to assign a grade at the end of the day, how do I do that in a way that it's not an affront to their, uh, to, to their sensibilities and to their perception of what they were doing? I know that I don't think that really answered your question, but I hopefully exposed a little bit of how I've been trying to think through and approach it. Um, it it's a real challenge, and this is what I'm struggling with as I'm trying to get better at being a, a teacher, is I'm really struggling with how do you uh, leave opportunity for doing things differently and not prescribe how things need to be done while still motivating and encouraging certain kinds of uh, certain kinds of behaviors or certain kind of valuable contributions. I don't, I haven't learned how to do that yet. I pro probably need to spend a lot more years being a teacher before I feel confident that I can be the person to answer that question. Yeah. I'm going to jump in as well if, that, if that's okay. Um, so I also teach uh, using hypothesis regularly um, in all of my courses now. And I want to answer your question by talking to the fact that I think the, the, the nature of annotation as a practice particularly as a social practice changes over the course of a semester, let's say, and it also changes within the discursive practices, even in a single text. And this gets in some respects out, Larry, you know, you're really kind of interesting comments around this border and the definition of what is the context and what is the activity that is on the text. So here's a very practical example. Um, I teach a doctoral level learning theory seminar and my students, as the semester progresses, will find different ways of utilizing annotation within even the same text. And I see three kind of dominant purposes of annotation, particularly as they have more sophisticated learning practices over time. So in one respect, they're just working on comprehension. What do these ideas mean? This is a class about learning theory. We're reading Vygotsky, we're reading Piaget, and we read more contemporary kind of ecological perspectives. This is rather complex work at the PhD level. And at some point, annotation is used entirely around understanding concepts and relating those then to other theories, scholars, what have you. At a second way of annotating and having conversation, these are also future researchers and future scholars, and they should be pushing back on other research and sharing their ideas in perhaps a more healthy, critical way. And so we see annotation as a way of speaking back to the perspectives of authors. What's missing? What's not here? Who's not been included? And that idea of public critique in conversation with a text and an author is an entirely different way of annotating than simply reading for comprehension. And then the third way, which is also very distinct again, comes because, again, these are future researchers, and they're reading literature for so, that, for so that they themselves can write. And so they're highlighting and annotating and extracting information for a future literature review or to support a claim and an argument. And so as my learning community evolves over the course of a four-month semester, I need to be responsive to this kind of evolution of annotation practice that really meets very different objectives. So if I'm aware of that, then I can maybe perhaps 
look at the quality and grade that, but I need to also then be responsive to the kind of annotation needs of my students, even within the same text. Just very briefly, the, last, the other kind that I see a lot of is the students just trying to entertain each other and talk to each other and having conversation. And then I, I tend to see that as a valuable contribution, right? They're building a community of practice with each other. They're not really enhancing their understanding of the text, but they're helping to keep each other engaged with the ideas of the text. So they're, they're, they post memes for each other, and they're like making, they, they start sort of just harking back at like, they make inside jokes that I have no idea what they're talking about. So you know, it's like my, the program I teach is a cohort program. They're together a lot for eight months, right? And so by the time they get to the end, I, you know, they're laughing all the time, and none of us instructors have any idea of what it is that they're laughing about. And th that's coming in in the annotations on top of all of those other things. I think it's, part, I think it's a valuable contribution, but it, even though it's not part of learning what the text is about. Yeah. Um, just to add to that original question, I think when it comes to evaluating these annotations for a grade, I think this also sometimes comes back to that tension that you get in a humanities course where there's an art, there's a level of style that you're being rewarded for. Um, and students often want it to be a science, and they want it to be, you know, I did this, so, you know, give me the points. <laughs> um, and so I am curious how your platform is weighing in on that in terms of giving it some sort of an assessment score. Sure, yeah, so what we, we do is we, first of all, we, we look at the, at the grades that come out of, of annotations as, being different than the grades you would give students for an exam or for a project or for a paper in the sense that those sorts of grades you're looking to use them to differentiate between your your stronger students and your weaker students so you can you know come up with a with a end of semester grade this may contribute to the end of semester grade as well but in a in a small way and the main purpose of it from my perspective is really to motivate students to do what we what we need them to do to to be better prepared for class and for the discussion that you're going to have in class um, and so, to that end, we, we've we've set up the scoring so that it's 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 we've tried not we try not to be over precise. So each each um, each annotation is is scored either you know on a three point scale, so low, medium, or high. And that we found that that's those are um, that's a, a schematic that we can classify um, annotations into pretty reliably um, when compared to how how an expert teacher would would manually grade grade the same things. Hi, I'm George Corser from Saginaw Valley State University. I'm a fellow young faculty member. Um, <clears throat> and I have a question that's basically the, the distinction between a technology and psychology. Like we just heard it, you guys started talking about it while I was sitting here in line. Uh, somebody told me if you, if you want to ruin the, the enthusiasm, keep it up like this, like that? Okay, wow, oh, this is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> If you want to ruin people's enthusiasm, put the topic in the classroom. In other words, students annotate. They annotate the heck out of Facebook. They annotate the heck out of a lot of places, right? It's very similar to annotation anyway. It's not annotation itself. The question is, what is it that they're eager to comment on? What are they eager to think about? They want to think about the person of the opposite sex sitting next to them in the classroom. They don't want to think about, you know, Shakespeare, right? That's just reality. And, and in my classroom, there are a few, but not very many, who ever are going to be researchers. They're mostly people who are going to go out into, you know, factory jobs or if there's any left or something, you know, farming or whatever it is. But it is important that they play the role of a citizen. It's important that they learn the things that an educated, modern person in a contemporary society needs to learn. And I think annotation would be good. The question is, how do we, how do we as educators divide the stuff that we can fix with or help with in terms of the technology of annotation versus the psychology of just human beings that are going to screw off and, and uh, be mischievous and be normal people, right, at that age, which is cool, but, you know, may not be appropriate in all cases, but, but you know what I'm saying? We have to, we have to mentally, how do, you, how do you separate that? How do you deal with that fact? and not conflate the two things and saying, well, geez, you're not just the most wonderful student. You could be so much more. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to work at my dad's shop when I graduate, right? Well, if I can answer that, <clears throat> I think one of the interesting things about annotation is 
Uh, students don't know what they know. Oftentimes, students underestimate what they know. Um, you know, if you take that meme, the kid or the student posted up there from the office, you know, they kind of threw that up there because they had some idea it was about love and being cynical about love. But really, there's a lot in that meme and a lot in understanding that meme and understanding why it's significant that they're not, they don't really know. I think the other thing to think about is this, is we think, I th you know, and this is a kind of problem with the technology as well in a way and also with our this uh, continued dependence we have on the page, I think, as a kind of vehicle or medium. But in any case, uh, we think of annotation as somehow bordering or bounding a page, I think, sometimes. That it's like footnotes or marginalia. But what if we thought about annotation in a different way? That is, every time we annotate a text, we are taking the text out of where it belongs and putting it somewhere else. You know what I mean? Whether it's in a conversation, or in the case of some of the visual stuff I do where I'm kind of asking the students, take the text out of the classroom and put it in TV land, or put it in, you know what I mean, put it in movie land, or put it in music land from uh, the places they're supposed to be. They can be very impious in a way, you know what I mean, taking text like Shakespeare or Malay out of the classroom and into some other context, which, which can be much more interesting, lively, active, and important for students. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times it just comes down to making the personal connections for them, and that's going to come out of getting to know your students. Those things come out when they're writing about the personal connections that they're going to annotate. And also, it's allowing for that, so letting them know that their, their personal connections are important to it and that it doesn't have to be completely high-minded uh, rhetorical analysis. Um, so, you know, it, it just comes specifically in terms of, of what you're asking them. I think yesterday I asked my juniors, you know, you're gonna set J. Alfred Prufrock up on a date. <laughs> what are you gonna tell the other person? And that's what they annotated. And they all told him to get therapy, but you know. <laughs> okay, and I think we should probably just take one more question and then wrap it up. Um, so, Reflecting on my experiences when I would participate in, in classes, um, I want to ask a question about, is annotation itself um, making the classes richer, or is it merely the fact that it compels people to actually do the reading? <laughs> I, I, think it, I think it's both. I don't, I don't think it's a one or the other. I think that uh, the fact that the students you have done the readings, it enriches the classroom, right? This is like, even if they weren't annotating, if they could just commit to actually, if they were reading it through to the end and not annotating, the class discussion would be better than when only half. And one of the most frustrating things is when you have three, four people that have done the readings really well, and then you have another 15 people that haven't, it, you end up spending the class sort of explaining what the readings were for those 15 people, and then those people that have already know what they were are just there doing, like, just there doing nothing or providing that explanation. So, but I think that the annotations themselves, like I said, I think for me it's been really important for me to be able to pull out what the discussions were, and then you can take the, you can take the conversation so much further than, because already all of what would have happened in the classroom would happen already in the annotations. Now you have an opportunity to have a completely new kind of uh, direction to take the discussion in. Uh, and I think that that's the kind of enrichment of the experience that I think is, is the additional value of actually annotating beyond just compelling the, the reading in the first place. Um, you know, I'm, as you can see from my hairstyle, <laughs> I've been around for a while. And I've been around long before online annotations. And so, there, in other words, what I'm trying to say is there are eight million ways to make students read if you want to make them read. You know what I'm saying? And those have been around since long before online annotation. Um, and so, really, for me, the issue is not or the stu you know, that, because I can solve that problem if it's a problem in a variety of ways. It's, in a way, what does it mean when the students read? There's reading, and then there's reading. You know, there's reading like, yeah, yeah, uh, Hamlet, some dude who has some father issue or whatever. Then there's, you know, to dream or not to dream. You know what I mean? So there's different kinds of reading. And the, the goal is not just, I don't, if the student doesn't read or if the student just reads it like they read a Chinese takeout menu, it's the same to me. What I want is the engaged, authentic, real, 
You know what I mean? And I think the online anna annotation, et cetera, is a really valuable tool for that. Yeah, I would also add that um, it, it kind of makes the student r go back to the, the reading the way that you would as the teacher in the sense that uh, we're pulled in a million directions every day and no matter how many times we've taught that text, we need our annotations to throw us back into it sometimes and to, to get everything going and, and to have, make it meaningful. Same thing goes for the students. It's, it, I, I find that it's a much more meaningful conversation um, because they're, they're not losing all that critical thinking that they were doing you know, the first time around when we come back together as a class. Just really, really briefly, I, I think also what we, you know, we found is that uh, there are a, lot, a lot of students don't know how to read. I mean, they know how to read, but they don't know how to, to read, right? And, and so, to me, what we, one of the things we can do with annotations is model active reading and show them this is this is how you this is how you you can really get a lot more out of reading than just you know passing your eyes over the page and understanding all all of the words. Can we have another round of applause for our panelists, please? And thank you for everyone's contributions.